Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Elliott Bay Book Company. Um, it is my great honor to be able to welcome Michael Hart back to the store uh, to discuss his new book, The Subversive 70s. Uh, Michael Hart is a political philosopher and literary theorist who teaches political theory in the literature program at Duke University. He is the co-author with Antonio Negri of the Empire Trilogy, and most recently also with Antonio Negri of Assembly, out now from Oxford University Press, uh, as well as many other books, some of which we have available for sale in the back. Um, he is also the co-director with Sandro Metzadra of the Social Movements Lab at Duke. The lab is a hub for campus events organized to understand various social movements in progress and in relation to each other, connecting students, faculty, and Duke departments, centers, and institutes in the humanities and social sciences. In this new book, The Subversive 70s, Hart argues that progressive and revolutionary movements of the 70s across the globe can provide an inspiring and useful guide for contemporary radical political thought and action. Sounds pretty cool, right? I'm very excited for this. Uh, this uh, event tonight is uh, sponsored and co-hosted uh, with Red May. And I'm going to invite Philip Walster up here to say a few words. Uh, and then afterward, we'll have a Q&A, and there'll be a signing in the back. Um, and yeah, thanks all for being here. Here's Philip. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Red May in December. <laughs> we usually do Red May in May, but uh, the spirit came over us, and Michael and Kathy always come back to town uh, in December. Uh, and they are the sort of godfather and godmother of Red May, so we, we like to dream up events for them. And for, fortunately, Michael has written a wonderful book uh, that is worth a lot of discussion. It's, it's about the 70s, and I remember the 70s. And uh, I, looking at a lot of people here, I see that they too remember the 70s and were through them. And, and if you think of uh, the angel of history of uh, Walter Benjamin, who moves into the future backwards, looking at the debris as it gathers up, and, and also uh, seizes moments of the past, in, seizes fragments of the past in moments of danger, and discovers that there's a path out of them that doesn't lead to the future that we're heading, but to another one. Michael has sort of occupied that role of the angel of history and found all these fragments uh, from the 70s uh, which seem to have a lot of future before them. And uh, so I invite Michael to uh, uh, tell us about his book, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards. Maybe we'll kind of move all the chairs in a sort of a semicircle so we can have more of a cozy discussion. But we'll see afterwards. Michael Hart, welcome back to Red Man. Thanks, Philip. Thanks um, to, uh, to Ellie Bay and to Red May uh, for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I wanted to start with a couple uh, hypotheses in, 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 in my approaching the, these revolutionary movements of the 1970s. Yeah, the idea was, was really to, um, to analyze revolutionary movements of the 1970s in as many countries as I could. And one of the hypotheses guiding this was that the 1970s is really the beginning of our era. Often when one thinks about the, the, the last revolutionary moment, uh, the 1960s is thought of, in, and of course the 1960s were important and, and um, history changing. Um, but it seems to me that the 1960s are really part of, our, uh, of the past whereas the 70s are part of our present. And I guess I mean that in two senses, or maybe two ways of saying why, the, what, what, why, in what way the 70s is the beginning of our era. The first way you could approach it is from the, um, from the opposite side, let's say. You know, that, the, that a new forms of power were formed in the 1970s that still rule over us today. Often discover, uh, discussions about neoliberalism identified as starting in the 1970s, maybe in 1973 in Chile, maybe in the later 70s with Reagan and Thatcher. 
and that that is still the, the dominant form of power in which we face. You could also think of it in economic terms, like uh, in shifts of the form of production from Fordism to post-Fordism, or you could think about the, the era when the um, manufacturing in the dominant countries was either automated or, or, or shift overseas. So that these are ways in which the forms of power shifted, and so you might think that we're still in the same in the same era. I'm much more interested in the other side of the equation, which is that um, the, the nature of, let's say, the problems facing revolutionary action, you know, revolutionary possibilities, are really the same. Or I would say something like that the political problems that were identified by the revolutionary movements are still our problems. Yeah, I was, I was charmed by a, a, um, a line from Louis Althusser, I think it's in Reading Capital, where he says something like, uh, there's nothing harder and takes longer to solve than a false problem. And he says that the idea, the idea, what a philosopher is supposed to do, according to him, is to identify real problems, to dispel those false problems, to identify the real problems. And I think that's exactly what also um, the job of political movements is to identify real political problems and to dispel false ones. So some of those real political problems, I guess I'll get to them in a minute, um, identify the real political problems and, and the corresponding concepts. So yeah, so like I said, I, I, was, I was trying to address uh, perhaps a, 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 an impossible task, uh, address revolutionary movements in as many countries as I could. Of course, you know, my own limitations of whatever uh, linguistic abilities um, and such, it, it, it's the kind of project which I think invites people to say, but why didn't you talk about X? Why didn't you talk about Y? Which is, in fact, I would love to do that if you were to have ideas afterwards. Um, that would be part of the discussion. But what I, um, what I definitely did find, and maybe this is a first impression uh, with these movements, is that one can see easily in many revolutionary movements or progressive movements in the 1970s, how they presented seeds of uh, the current movements today. Like, for instance, um, the development of affinity groups and anti-nuclear movements at Seabrook and the Clamshell Alliance, that then the affinity groups we see in, in organizing from, you know, easily from the ultra-globalization movement through Occupy, et cetera. Um, or the kinds of encampments, you know, like for instance, uh, in France and in Japan in the 1970s, there were these decade-long encampments in France that was occupying the site of an expansion of a military base in, in Japan. It was the uh, occupying the site that was supposed to be the construction of the Tokyo airport, Narita, which then became Narita. And that in some ways foresaw the kind of encampments we have today, like at uh, Cop City outside of Atlanta, or many of the French uh, encampments, the current one, this um, called Soulèvement de la Terre. So it's like, so, Anyway, we see, the, we see the kind of, what would you call it, seeds of the present in these movements. I find that a little bit less interesting than the opposite, which is that um, so in some ways I find that the movements of the 1970s were actually ahead of us, and we have to catch up to them, like that they were more advanced. You know, so in, on the one hand, I guess I, I see that in two, two directions, maybe. You know, on one hand, that they uh, have the... Uh, beginnings of something that flourished later on, and another thing, uh, on the other hand, is we can see in them what what uh, politics could be today, and isn't yet uh, living up to, or is no longer living up to. Maybe something like that. Okay. Second hypothesis, you know, the first hypothesis, like I said, was that the '70s was the beginning of our era. A second is about um, the kind of theoretical work that's done in uh, political movements. Um, and generally the idea is, maybe I'm saying a commonplace here, is that there's no division of labor whereby uh, intellectuals think and activists act. Instead, um, that there is a kind of theorizing that goes on in social movements, a kind of uh, theorizing that's done in collectives, often in different terms or, or maybe even in a different register, but then nonetheless the movements themselves produce concepts. And so partly what I think is a challenge uh, 
And the useful one is to try to recognize uh, the concepts and the, what you call it, theoretical advances that are developed in these movements themselves. And so uh, there are a couple of concepts that I was trying to work with, which I'll talk about in a few minutes about, uh, such as multiplicity, articulation, not always that the movements that the activists talked about in mean, these terms, but I think that they are concepts that, that emerge directly from the movements. Um, yeah, I don't mean, of course, that the kind of work, uh, theoretical work that's done, I don't know, in libraries uh, is not important. Actually, what I'm thinking about is that trying to do the kind of negotiation of recognizing uh, the relationship or, or exchange possible between these different levels of theorizing. And, and, and in particular, which I think is, is a difficult work, which is to recognize the kinds of concepts that develop out of movements themselves. Okay, um, maybe one last thing before starting, or maybe two, um, <clears throat> which is that, um, like I said, when one talks about, uh, thinks about uh, the recent revolutionary past, it's the 1960s that most often comes to mind, or is that, I, I think, the cultural commonplace about the 60s was the last revolutionary era. And um, when talking about the 70s, and especially these revolutionary movements in the 70s, it's impossible, I think, not to pose the comparison to the 1960s. One of the commonplaces about, I, I think, the 70s and the revolutionary movements in the 70s in comparison to the 60s is that um, the idea is that in, in the 70s, everything fell apart. The 70s was the era of fragmentation in, in contrast to a supposed uh, unity that defined the revolutionary movements of the, of the 1960s. I think that this, um, I think that this is actually the, the wrong way of thinking about it and, and does and maybe misrecognizes some of the things that I find, find most interesting about revolutionary movements in the 1970s. Um, let's say wrong way of thinking about it because um, what this, the, the fragmentation that's often characterized, you know, that, that, that's often thought to characterize the 1970s was a refusal of uh, different subjects and different forms of struggle <clears throat> to uh, accept subordination under uh, a hegemonic struggle, often thinking about uh, the workers' movement as, as the dominant force. You know, so that uh, feminists, gay and lesbian struggles, struggles of people of color were thought to be uh, the cause of fragmentation, even then sometimes solidifying a bit later in a notion of identi identity politics that ruins the, uh, the supposed unity of the left. There you go, something like that. Um, in fact, it, uh, maybe I should just say a little bit more about this because <clears throat> the 1970s in, in many of the countries, in the US in particular, but also in, in many of the European countries and some of the Latin American countries, was a uh, decade of extremely strong labor militancy, uh, industrial labor militancy. Um, the number of strikes, the intensity of strikes um, were, were as high as they were for any time um, after World War II. And yet, uh, the 70s is also uh, the period, and this is what's more known about it, I guess, is about uh, the end of um, the basis for uh, revolutionary struggle of industrial workers. You know, partly through, like I said, through automation, through the exporting of uh, manufacturing to other countries. And the, what this was talked about at the time is, this is, this is the, um, the way it was, was framed in Italy at the time was that what was produced by this was the end of the centrality of the industrial worker. Like the end of the idea that the industrial worker could represent the struggles of the entire proletariat, as they said then, or you could say that the that the uh, struggles of the industrial worker could represent the entire uh, struggles of the left. So what it seems to me is a good starting point is to not see the end of the centrality of the industrial worker, like uh, as being able to represent the struggles as a tragedy, but rather as an opportunity. Um, an opportunity in two senses, or maybe mandate is better term than, than opportunity here. Uh, um, the mandate, one mandate is uh, the need for a new class uh, analysis of a new class composition, like recognizing 
the uh, let's say multiplicity within the working class which the industrial worker was meant to you know previously represent and the second and maybe more important one for me which I'm going to go on and try to talk about a little bit in a minute was that the end of the centrality of the industrial worker in revolutionary struggles requires then a process of articulation among different struggles you know that are not unified uh, so that uh, feminist struggles, gay and lesbian struggles, anti-racist struggles, and uh, worker struggles had to find a different mode of articulating together without being, in a way, led or subsumed under, um, under the worker struggle itself, under class struggle uh, as such. And so that poses a real problem. You know, I was saying before that um, I think one of the one of the central tasks of the movement is to recognize the real problems. The real problem is really how to articulate um, relatively autonomous struggles, uh, how to articulate them together. Like I said, I'm going to say a bit, a bit more about that in a minute, which is good. Okay, um, one last um, introductory thing before thing, which is that one of the things that I find I admire a lot about the uh, these movements in question, like these movements of the 1970s that I'm most interested in, was the uh, audacity of their aspirations, uh, the audacity of their visions. And primarily, you could put that um, under the rubric, really, of liberation, that all of these movements pose liberation <coughs> as their uh, goal and their realizable goal. You know, so that <clears throat> uh, the question was about worker liberation and about black liberation, about feminist liberation and gay liberation. Like liberation was the proximate and, uh, yeah, like I said, realizable goal. And it seems to me in many respects, we've lost that audacity of political vision. You know, so just to speak, I now speak in very approximate terms, but in some ways there's been a, a kind of downgrading of our aspirations, say from uh, gay liberation to marriage equality, or from worker liberation to uh, $15 an hour, from feminist liberation to gender equality, from black liberation to Black Lives Matter. Like these are all important goals, or important reforms at least, um, even questions of survival. But um, lack, it seems to me, the uh, utopian vision that's implied in, um, in liberation as a goal. The one way one might, I mean, one might, uh, if, I, if, I were to, if I were to object to myself, like the one, the one object I, was, I would start with might be about the question of ab abolition today and how the discourses about abolition function. Because <clears throat> I do think the various di discourses about abolition, uh, you know, the variety of them from prison abolition and the abolition of the police, the abolition of ICE, to abolition of borders, to family abolition, to uh, abolition of the gender binary. A number of uh, discourses today about, or political projects today about abolition, I think could allude towards a question of liberation. Like it might be that there uh, one could find, I think the um, potential for a radicality of vision, as long as that abolition is not thought of simply as uh, clearing the terrain or as a negative struggle, but despite the term itself is, is, is understood as a um, uh, positive project, the proposition or alternative, something like that. Okay, it's so, um, you know, when I, when I started this project here, this is just maybe a, per, whatever, personal anecdote is parenthesis, so maybe it doesn't uh, relate to the way you're thinking about it at all, but I, I had a lot of trouble starting the project with a very specific obstacle, and that was, um, maybe there are two sides to it. One is the, the uh, increased repression in the 1970s and its, and its effects, and the other was uh, armed struggle and uh, the clandestine armed groups. Um, the, the repression in, in some ways, the, the shifting of the relation of the state to social contestation, uh, creating an atmosphere in which it seemed completely futile to uh, protest, uh, 
In other words, that protest was no longer met with uh, response of reform by the government or or even by by party mediation or or uh, etc. And that instead, what what um, the responses were were only through um, various forms of police and state violence. I mean, express violence, uh, even you know to the point of targeted assassinations, uh, repressing protests, but also all kinds of forms of infiltration, misinformation, etc. Uh, think of just as the classic case of the uh, FBI's various operations against the Black Panther Party, but that's not, I mean, that's only the, you know, one, one instance among many. So on the one hand, there was that, and, and not, not unrelated to that was the um, creation in the 1970s of uh, forms of clandestine armed struggle that conducted extremely spectacular operations with, uh, with few participants um, I'm thinking about, for instance, the Red Brigades' as Aldo Moro kidnapping and, and assassination, the Red Army faction in Germany and Japan, and their spectacular operations. The one thing, the reasons these were obstacles for me is that um, I think they occupied such a large place, they do still, they did in the 70s and I think they still do today, occupy such a large place in the cultural memory um, that they eclipse the uh, political activities and political organizations that I actually find much more interesting. And so uh, I think once if by focusing on them, it stopped me from getting to the things that I that I actually found much uh, more productive and more interesting and involved much more people too. Um, so I could come back later if you were interested to talk about like the way I uh, my thinking both about the various forms of repression and their effects, and then, or and also the on the other hand, thinking about the armed struggle. But instead of doing that, because like I said, uh, I think that that distracts from what I'm really after. Let me just give you two aspects of um, these revolutionary movements that most inspired me. The first, uh, so one one is about revolutionary democracy, and the other is about multiplicity and articulation. The first about revolutionary democracy is maybe uh, relatively straightforward. One, the, what, one of the things that most uh, interests me here is the recognition or the starting point that uh, the kinds, the forms of democracy that were taught and that were um, assumed that democracy, you know, that were taught is, is the form that democracy takes, were rejected by these movements, but not in the way that they would then reject democracy. Instead, uh, they found means to propose alternative forms of democracy um, and fuller forms. Yeah, maybe that's even the way of saying it. Yeah, so here's two, two historical instances that, that helped for me. So the first was um, the movements in the Portuguese colonies in Africa, uh, you know, which were still fighting against uh, Portugal at the time, Guinea-Bissau, um, Angola and Mozambique, and um, the and they they theorized themselves and they, they had two slogans really. One was popular power, and the other was revolutionary democracy. And um, what they meant by revolutionary democracy was uh, the uh, a democracy that is based on a committee or what they call commission structures, starting at the village level. You know, we're talking about these uh, anti-colonial. Um, forces in countries where there was 99% uh, uh, of the population was illiterate and, and didn't have um, political training, let's say, in, in, democratic, um, in democratic practices. So that uh, these commissions were set up as, as, a, as both decision-making structures and as organs of political education. One of the things that, that I found uh, striking about this was, was uh, the, the notion that the Portuguese colonies afforded actually a better uh, place for doing this. You know, so Portugal was the, the longest standing fascist uh, government, uh, you know, at the time and now, and now uh, still, of course, the, the, last, the, the longest lasting fascist government. And, um, the anti-colonial um, leaders 
remarked that the, uh, in the French and the British colonies, the um, post-colonial governments adopted or main, even maintained many of the governmental structures that the British and the French had, had in a sense, left behind. And the, the way they explained it is that they, they were fortunate because the Portuguese left no furniture laying about, <laughs> which I think is a lovely idea. Like the, it's sort of like that, a, that a clear slate where they could invent democracy anew. That's what I, that's what, um, and, and so it, this was their way of doing it, you know, so that they didn't have, um, you know, the legal code of the Raj, and they didn't have all of the, the different French parliamentary structures that then are uh, adopted in other countries. Instead, they could start with, with these, um, from the ground up, there's a way of thinking about it. You know, these committee structures of, of democratic decision making. So, and then there's, um, maybe I should go with one development of that, I guess, further. So, uh, the, the, the Portuguese, the, the revolution in Portugal that overthrew the fascist government in 1974, in some ways was precipitated by the anti-colonial movements. You know, that the, the Portuguese government fell in part because of the inability to maintain the, the colonial wars. But one of the really charming stories, which I'm not at all sure is true, is that the, um, the colonels who led this um, overthrow of the fascist government in Portugal, the colonels who had, who had returned from the colonies, um, the idea was that they um, learned the, de the practices of radical democrat uh, democracy in Angola and Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau, and then in the Portuguese Revolution, that they then put it to practice in Portugal. And in fact, in Portugal, um, they uh, was a, it's in fact a much more articulated system of these uh, popular commissions. There were essentially three streams of them. There were worker commissions that often um, had self-managed factories, uh, what they called neighborhood commissions, which largely dealt with housing, like reoccupying housing, housing people who didn't have houses, but deciding everything in these commissions, you know, in a, in a democratic neighborhood structure, and then rural commissions, which were essentially about land occupation and land redistribution. But it's a lovely story about the, and, and, and perhaps true, um, that the colonizers learned from the colonized uh, a revolutionary practice that then could be applied at home. Okay, so that's my whole, the first, I mean, there are many other ways in Chile, uh, in many other countries that this practices of revolutionary democracy uh, was practiced. But let me pass to the, my, the other idea before, um, before coming to an end, um, which is, you know, like I said, about multiplicity and articulation. And what I'm thinking about here is about the ways of um, struggling together of relatively autonomous struggles. Okay, I, I'll try to fill that in, in a minute. In fact, so it starts really here, and this is at least conceptually for me a start, I'm not sure it's a start in some historical way, is um, the socialist feminist theorizations of capitalist patriarchy in the US and the UK um, in the 1970s. And what interests me most here is both in the theorization of power and in the theorization of the movements that there's a recognition that there can be no priority between the different structures, between the different structures of power. So here, um, now, now I'm thinking about a, an essay that I, I know many of you know uh, by Iris Young, I believe it's in a volume called Women and Revolution, in which um, in theorizing uh, capitalist patriarchy, she says it would make no sense to say, to, theor to understand a concept of capitalist patriarchy. If you were to understand capital to be primary, and patriarchy would be secondary, then it would just be essentially a theory of capital with patriarchal characteristics. Or if you would quite rationally say, no, in fact, patriarchy is, is primary because it has 2,000 years of history and capital only has 200, uh, or something like that. She said, no, instead what you have to, uh, a notion of capitalist, patriarchal, capitalist patriarchy has to understand the two structures of power as relatively autonomous, like one doesn't cause the other, and that there would be no priority uh, between the two. Now, the more important thing I would say is on the other side, which, which Iris Young and, and the other socialist feminists are also uh, directly concerned with, which is, what is the relationship between feminist struggle and anti-capitalist struggle? And there, too, the idea is that the two can be articulated 
I mean, that's my term, not theirs, but still, nonetheless, that the, only, the two can be articulated, cap, anti-capitalist struggle and feminist struggle, only when one, I would say, strategically constructs the, con the conditions for there to be no priority between them. And I guess I would emphasize this, this strategic nature of it because you could, even, you could easily come up with rationales like I was just giving even, you know, uh, whatever, offhand ways of, of saying this a minute ago, of, of the priority of one over the other. You know, like, I don't know, could you measure, I don't know, what is the, could you measure the suffering caused by capital and the suffering caused by patriarchy? If like, I don't know if one was 56 and one was 54. I, I don't know what the, how you would do that. But anyway, I, I think it does have to be not a, um, there's nothing empirical about this question of there being no, no priority. That's what I mean, there has to be a strategic decision. Um, and, then, and then of course, and this is part of the struggles in the 1970s in the US in particular too, and especially on feminist terrain, that it's not just about these two structures of power, but many others. I mean, one of the um, passages that I'm most, or one of I'm struck by in the Kumbaki River Collective's statement in 1977, that's so well known is a, a statement where they say we came together as a um, because we were we were um, we shared uh, a feminist and anti-racist struggle, but as we continued our political education, that's not exactly the term they used, but more or less that, we also became an anti-imperialist struggle, an anti-capitalist struggle, um, anti-heteronormative struggle. I can't remember what the others they said, but I like this idea. You know, like people get annoyed about these um, interminable lists, and I'm all happy with them. I think the interminable lists are really a signal of political education. Like that that's what, that, that additions is, is a, um, requires the learning. So if the Kumbaki River Collective had, had continued together, they would have undoubtedly confronted ableism and uh, transphobia and any number of other things that they could add to the list. But the important thing is, and this is I think true for them too, is that none of them, um, none of those struggles can be given priority over the others. Um, because then articulation among them wouldn't be possible. There you go. Okay, one, one last example of this, or it's sort of in a different domain. It's now I wanted to talk about, to give a, two historical examples of um, multiracial struggles where I would say uh, different racializations are able to articulate in the same way because there's a refusal of the priority of one over the other. So the first with, and these are, I think examples that many of you will know too, so it's easy that way. I want to start with the Third World Liberation Front, which was a student group, first at San Francisco State College in 1968, then at Berkeley, and then at City College of New York, also with the same name. Um, and what they were, you know, so they, they were student groups that demanded uh, curricular changes and admissions changes to admit more students of color, to change the curriculum, to study, um, to, to create ethnic studies, eventually uh, black studies, et cetera. And so this one at San Francisco State, uh, the Third War Liberation Front, uh, was really the, com the yeah, combination of five different student groups. There was the Black Student Union, the uh, Mexican Student Group, the, the Latin American Student Group, Filipino students, and Chinese students. Um, they were all USers, you know, actually, but, but and they, and they, I think that the term third world, although it you know, can seem strange in retrospect to have all of these uh, US people calling themselves third world, um, I think what the term third world did for them was to um, pose a terrain on which there wasn't a priority of one over the other. So what's important for me in this group is that it wouldn't function or it wouldn't uh, be able to function the same way if it was essentially the Black Student Union was leading it, and the other, the other uh, racializations that were in some ways junior partners. Um, that it functions, you know, a racial multiplicity, this is my argument, I guess, you know, can function only insofar as there's a refusal of a priority of one over the others. It seems similar to me. It's a slightly different context. It's a very different context. but. I think it's the same idea I, in the black consciousness movement in South Africa, um, the way that the notion of black functioned. 
Yeah, here we go. And I'm taking this from, you know, so Steve Biko, who's the most uh, well-known and, and, and was at the time most visible leader in the black consciousness movement, um, he testified for, uh, for apartheid court. He wasn't actually one of the accused. Other members of SASO, the student group that's, uh, that he was part of, were, were on trial, but he was asked by the apartheid judges to explain what black consciousness meant, you know, what their movement was. And so he gave this testimony, which, which we have record of, which is, which is amazing. Um, so at a certain point in the, in the testimony, he tries to under, explain to them what it means to be black. And so he starts by saying, you know, there's no such thing as a black policeman. That's just a contradiction in terms. I can't be a black policeman because you can only be black if you're part of the struggle, regardless of your skin color. So uh, in the same way that there can be no black policemen, that uh, people of you know, like the so-called coloreds in South Africa, people of South Asian descent, they're black as long as they're part of the struggle. And so black became a political designation that in a way that refused the priority, it seems to me, among the different racial groups and posed them, uh, that articulated them together under the notion of blackness um, as long, yeah, without, yeah, I think the political designation itself is part of what I was saying before would be, is this strategic decision to refuse the priority of one over the other. Okay, obviously there's an intimate relation between that notion of revolutionary democracy I was describing earlier and this notion of articulation among struggles. It's not exactly the same thing, but, but it, I, I would say they're, they're related to each other. But I should, um, I should stop with that because I do want um, to talk some, and I realize I've already talked too long. So I just want to end with one thing, um, which is, which was really um, yeah, precipitated to me, for me, by when I showed the manuscript, you know, still uh, unfinished form, to a friend and read, and read about it and someone who had, uh, you know, been a protagonist in the 1970s and knew about it. And he says, Michael, you know, this is all very inspiring and everything, but we lost. You know, and that all the movements here you're talking about, we lost. And so I, I realized it didn't pose a problem for me, so I tried to think through that. Um, like, I do want to win, don't get me wrong. But, um, like, one way of approaching it, this is the one, uh, a well-known uh, sentence in the beginning of Robin Kelly's book, Freedom Dreams, um, where he says, uh, let's see, too many focus on whether a movement uh, succeeds rather than the quality of its vision. I'm, not, I'm okay with that. You know, like that, that's, I think a good, that, that's a definitely a good start. You know, like whether you win or lose isn't so much as the question about the, the necessity of vision, but maybe that's actually, maybe now that I'm saying it, that is what, uh, related to what I wanna say. What I would say instead is, I wanna distinguish between failure and defeat. A failure, a movement fails for internal flaws. And in some ways the failure poses the end of the road. Like that that's because of the internal flaws. It really doesn't, it, it may have been wonderful and everything, but, but that's as far as it could go. Whereas defeats are not the result of internal flaws, but a superior external force. Um, and defeats precisely because of that uh, aren't the end of the road. Like what defeats pose is a kind of um, platform or point of arrival by which you could then start again. So it seems to me that, that recognizing these as defeats, and I do think they are defeats, you know, the, the different ones I've been talking about with you just now, but also um, the others that interest me, because they're defeats, we're able to pick up where they left off, and they pose uh, possibilities for us for talking about, um, and for, for developing, yeah, there you go, for developing contemporary movements and going further with them. I should stop there, I guess in the hope that, um, well, okay, you can talk about anything you want, actually. But one of the things, what would be an obvious thing to talk about was be how, what does this mean for today? What, how does it relate to things going on today, which I didn't talk about at all. But I wanna stop now because I've already gone to, on too long and I, I wanna start talking together. Thanks.